Welcome to the Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2022. This webinar is part of Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2022. It is a collaboration between Law Society Pro Bono Services, the five Community Development Councils, National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, Singapore University of Social Sciences School of Law, Singapore Management University School of Law, and the Singapore Corporate Council Association Pro Bono Chapter, supported by the People's Association. I am Jerry Lim, and am your host for this webinar. Today's webinar is Preparing for Golden Years, what we need to know before the golden years. First, some housekeeping matters. Today, we will be using Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar and also upvote on any questions that interest you. If you have a smartphone or tablet with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode, which is LAWCDC03. I repeat, LAWCDC03, as shown on the slide. Alternatively, you can click on the link shared in the chat function to launch Pigeonhole Live on your device. If you are viewing this webinar on your laptop or desktop, you should receive an invitation to launch Pigeonhole. Please do note that today's discussion is not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. And with that, I would like to introduce our panelist for today's webinar, Rajan Chetia. Rajan Chetia is a barrister at law from the United Kingdom and qualified as an advocate and solicitor of Singapore in 1970, excuse me, 1997. He is the managing part director of Rajan Chetia LLC, a boutique family and personal law firm. He is, well, he is a well-regarded family lawyer who has acted in high net worth domestic and international divorces. Rajan is also an associate mediator with the Singapore Mediation Centre, a volunteer mediator in the State Courts, Centre for Dispute Resolution, and the Community Mediation Centre. He is also a collective, excuse me, a collaborative family lawyer, child representative, and a parent coordinator. He is a director of the first private mediation company in Singapore, Resolvers Private Limited, which offers private mediation. He is a board member of the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals based in the United States of America. Rajan, thank you very much for joining us today and I hope you're having a lovely evening. Yes, Jerry, good to be here today. Thank fantastic, you. Fantastic, fantastic. And with that, we are moving to our very first slide. Why are we here today? And why think about these uncomfortable questions right now? And perhaps more importantly, why listen to uh, you know, a young punk like myself and a lawyer like Rajan? As you and I know, there are two things in life that are inevitable, death and taxes. And while Singapore makes it very easy to prepare one's taxes, it is not often as clear how someone should prepare for their death. The task may seem daunting and uncomfortable. So today's session is not meant to give you the easy solution to these questions, but provide you with a good starting point to ask yourself how to address these issues in order to First, make your wishes clear to your family and loved ones. Second, relieve some stress faced by your family and loved ones in times of grief that they may not be able to accurately predict what you had actually intended. And finally, give you control over any time you have left. How can you plan ahead? Next slide, please. There are actually four main ways that you should be aware of in order to plan ahead. Wills, lasting power of attorney, the advanced medical directive, and advanced care planning. And with that, we will move to our first topic this evening, wills. What is a will? And what goes and does not go into a will? How do we change a will? And what happens if you don't have a will? So let's talk about wills. 
um, my understanding is that this is a document that people are aware of, but is thought of as a complicated legal instrument. So simply put, a will would be something that um, tells our the people in the will um, how our assets should be distributed after our death. Um, Rajan, would you be able to briefly explain the requirements for a valid will? Sure. I think to start off, I will also use myself as an example this evening. So as, as what we're going to talk about is very sensitive. Um, so a will is a document that a, a person makes, setting out his wishes and the gifts that he wants to give and the people that he wants to share his wealth with when he's, when he's no longer around. So it, you can talk about specific gifts. For, for example, if I have a very precious watch, and I want to give it to my son, and I can say so in my will. Uh, but if I don't want to, and I just want to give whatever I have at the point of my death uh, to my family, then I can state so, um, and I can even state what is the percentage of what I want to give them. So, uh, and I think a will is something that, you know, the young and the old, we all should make, should, we all should make a will. So even I should make a will. Um, and uh, a will will... It's, it's a very simple kind of document. People say, oh, I don't have very much and therefore I shouldn't do a will. That's not so. Mm. I, I think we should do a will so that we have peace of mind and our wishes you know, are, are going to be uh, done or carried out when we're no longer, when we're no longer kind of around. Mm. Yeah. So what should and should not go into our will? Okay, I think what should go into a will is easier to answer than what shouldn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I think whatever are my wishes, you know, whatever I want to give, uh, you know, or, you know, or how I want to conduct things when I'm no longer, no, no, long, no longer am around, that should be in the will. Yeah. So, for example, I have clients, what they have done is that they have even stated how their funeral is, is to be carried out. And they have, you know, given very spe specific kind of wishes. Mm. Uh, some people may even want to, uh, you know, uh, make directions or their wishes known in relation to the pets. You know, people, you know, those people with, with, with power kids, you know, they do want to, uh, to uh, make very clear directions and wishes for, for, the, for the power kids. So I have, I, I have clients who will say, you know, you know, who's going to take care of the cats and dogs mm -hmm. and how are they going to be, going to be, to be taken care of and how much is going to be spent on them, you know, during the lifetime of the pet. Wow. Yeah, so it, it can be really very, very specific. So I don't think so. There's, you can't. I don't think so. There's, there's anything that you can't say in a will. I mean, if you look at it that way, what you can't say in a will is probably whatever is not legal. Yeah, <laughs> okay. fair enough. And, yeah. and I think that's not possible yeah. for any contract. Correct. Um, but maybe then my question will be, um, what do you need to think about? Because you mentioned think your wishes changing. Uh, what do you need to think about when you want to amend your will? Okay, I mean, people do make changes to the will. I have a friend who has in her lifetime made six to seven wills you know so so people do change their wills because the, their wishes changes or they may not want to give a certain thing to certain people like i for example did a will some years ago and i'm thinking about changing it mm. so when we're going to change your will it's i think it's a good practice to make a fresh will do a new will mm. yeah you know don't just do an attachment or you know or scribble down mm. because that the, the law in relating to wills and we want the will, will to be valid we, we don't want them to be invalid. And you talk about valid wills, you know, it must be properly re, uh, uh, in writing. It has to be set up very clearly. Mm. Uh, there should be no uh, vagueness or incomplete uh, uh, wishes or sentences. And most importantly, it has to be signed by myself in the presence of two witnesses. And I have to see the two witnesses signing the, the will in my presence. Mm. Yeah, so that's very important. So that, that's key. The signing part. The second part is, um, you know, it's good to, to to have it in writing. It's good to 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 have to have it in English, but if you choose to handwrite it or to write it in, you know, in in, in some other 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 languages, that's no problem too. Um, I'll make a quick housekeeping note because we are seeing some questions come in already and I, I have noted them down, but we do have a QA and a session at the very end. So keep them coming. I will uh, keep an eye on them and, and work them into our discussion uh, as and when it's um, relevant and necessary. Um, so thank you very much, everyone who's submitting questions already. Um, maybe let me ask this other question then. If it doesn't make sense for uh, someone like myself, uh, you know, with children, like, so if I have, 
say, a third child, uh, would it make sense for me at that point in time to think about amending my will? Or if I bought a new car, like what kind of events do, does one think about when, when uh, you know, getting a will done? No, I, I think that's a good question, Jerry. Yeah. I mean, people usually do wills when there are life changes. I used to have a client who did a new will whenever there's a new grandchild born mm. in the family. So in, in your case, when you have a third child, yes, you should make a will so that you can provide for him or her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, some people also uh, change the will or make a new will when they decide they don't want to give to a certain child. Like, for example, uh, you know, I have cases where a client feels that he has provided more than enough for one child. And therefore, in his will, he doesn't want to provide for, for that child so that the remaining children will get more. Oh, wow. So that's also a possible. And sometimes, unfortunately, you have you know life-changing events like death, then you want to change the will. Uh, if you have an executor who is no longer around, you may want to do a new will. Fair enough, fair enough. And I, I think that moves on to uh, perhaps a more important question, which is um, what happens if we pass on without actually having drawn up a will. Yeah. I mean, if I were to die without a will, or for example, if I just tear away the will I have right now and therefore I have no will, then, you know, then the intestate uh, law takes effect. Mm -hmm. That means the law sets out and says, okay, you do not have a will, so whatever is your estate will go in accordance to the law. I so see. which means my wife will get half and the remaining half will go to my children in equal shares, for example. That's that's very interesting because I think a lot of people have a lot of hesitation about drawing up a will precisely because, um, I mean, you mentioned earlier things like, oh, you know, one son has already gotten too much or one daughter has really gotten too much. So I want to give them less. Um, how does how does one make sure that uh, you are taking good care, I think, of of, 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 um, of these people, like making sure that your executor and, and they're all aware of all your wishes and stuff like that. How, how do you make sure that they know that you've already drawn up a will? Okay, okay. So your question is, how do I let people know that I have a will? Yeah. Um, usually, I mean, you do not have to inform your, your children or the beneficiaries. In fact, it's best not to, I think. <laughs> so there's no problems about what do I get in the will and you know, stuff like that. But in terms of my two trustees and uh, you know, who are going to be, take care of, of, my, uh, of my estate, I think it's a good practice to let them know, get a consent because it's a duty. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and um, you know, so that they know their will is made. And also it's very important, I think, to keep the will and your documents in a safe place. Let your, you know, wife or your loved ones at home know so they don't need to turn up the house, you know, up and down to try and find a will. Because I do have clients who have gone around the whole house trying to find a will. Lost and lost their wills. Uh, yes, can't find the will. They've <laughs> lost it. Or you know, it's 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 just not found. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah. what happens then if you if you lost your will? I think if you lost your will, then what people usually do is that they will put out an advertisement in, for example, you know, in the Law Gazette that's run by Law Society of Singapore, and they say, you know, do you know uh, of this person? You know, have you know, and this is name is I see number. Do you think that you know? Do you know whether he has done a will? So they they sort of uh, uh, write uh, you know check with all the law firms through the Law Gazette. Ah, oh, right, of course, because the law firms will keep a copy if you, yeah, if you execute right. your will. Yeah. So we usually firm. will keep a scan copy. Yeah. Okay, okay. So there is a, a backup, I guess, yes. in a sense. Correct. I see. And um, so I'm going to ask a couple of the que uh, questions that has already come up, which uh, has already been upvoted. Uh, thank you very much, um, the folks who are, who are watching live today. Um, if we already have a will, do we still need to have a separate nomination for insurance? Uh, wouldn't insurance count as part of the assets? I think that's a good question. Uh, in Sometimes insurance policies have a beneficiary named. If that person is named, then you don't have to uh, make a will in relation to the policy. Mm. But nowadays, more and more so, you see the name that's stated in the policies as estate. Yeah, uh, they don't name a person. They just say it goes to the estate. Then I think you will have to make a. Uh, you will have to state very clearly this. Uh, this policy goes to whom. I see. I see. Um, and can I also at this point of time talk about CPF? Uh, whatever you have in your CPF balances, that you can't wheel away. You have to make the, the relevant nomination. kind of of nomination with the CPF board. Yeah. So that's a very good tip. Uh, make sure that you do your your nomination CPF nomination separately from your will. Um. And we have another question that came in. 
um, do I need to let my loved ones know where the will is kept or can I let the lawyer keep it? Okay, I think we just talked about this a while ago. Yes. Yeah. Good practice. Keep it in a safe place. Let your wife, your children who are living with you, let them know where, where they are found. Uh, the, the, what the lawyers have is just a scan copy or spare copy. Yeah. So the primary one is what you keep. So keep safely and, and let them know. But to add on to that question, actually, is something that I thought of, which was, um, what if the executor is not your wife or loved ones? Is somebody else entitled? Uh, that's okay, because it's only the family members who have to go and find the will, yeah, which they will usually do once the funeral is over. I see, yeah. I see. So I think um, we will save some questions for the Q&A session later. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will, we will try not to repeat ourselves too much during this conversation. Um, I will move on to the lasting power of attorney. Um, and what what is uh, lasting power? Next slide, please. Uh, what is a last, lasting power of attorney? Um, who is involved in preparing the LPA? And what happens if you don't have an LPA? Um, so let's start off by asking, uh, I guess, a contextual question, which is, what is the LPA? Uh, the LPA is the talk of a town, uh, you know, and it's been so the last few years. Mm. It's a document uh, that gives... Uh, certain kind of powers to whom, what we call as donies. So for example, the one that I make, I will give the, 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 the powers to my wife and for her to decide on my welfare as well as on my property and, and my financial uh, matters. Mm -hmm. When does that kick in? It kicks in when I have become a human vegetable or I've lost my mind and I can't talk and I can't make decisions. Mm -hmm. So she technically steps into my shoes and then she makes those decisions. So uh, I'm known as a donor because I'm giving the power to her and she's the donor. And if you look at LPA form, uh, you know, which is a pre-printed form, mm -hmm. it states very clearly who, uh, who is the donor and donor, and there's lots of information there. Uh, in the LPA, you can choose whether you want to give the power of welfare for, to, for her to decide on welfare only or for her to decide on property and affairs only. So you can choose. Yeah, but usually it's, I think it's a good practice to choose both. Let the person make decision on both welfare, how I'm going to be taken care of for the rest of my life, and as well as my property and affairs. For example, can she get hold of my bank account, take the funds, and use it for my my welfare? I see. And on that note, I guess uh, can you have more than one donor? Yes, yes, that's a good question too. You can have more than one donor, and in the LPA form, you also see there are substitutes that you can have for donors. Yeah, so it is signed by myself in the presence of a lawyer or registered do uh, doctor, mm. um, and uh, and usually it's also good practice for the donors to be present during the same time mm. and for them to sign. We don't need to witness each other like a will, but you know, so that it's all of them are signed at the same time. Uh, I think it's just good practice. And then once that is signed, then it is uh, sent off to the OPG and an office of the public guardian, and then they will uh, write to uh, they will write back to me and say, "Okay, I've got it. Thank you very much." Yeah, that's helpful to know. Yeah. I guess the next question I would have is: is if you have more than one donee, um, what happens if they don't agree? Yeah. So LPA the form also takes care of that. Huh. It says whether do you want your donees that means the, the two persons, to jointly make decisions or to make de decisions by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can choose. You can say, for example, for welfare, I only want my wife, the first donor, to make a decision. When it comes to property and affairs, I want my second uh, do donor, that could be my brother, who is more maybe more sa sa savvy, mm -hmm. to make to make the, the, the decisions. And, ah, I see. Okay, so it's, it's one or the other uh, yeah. type thing. Okay, very good. Um, so, Maybe moving on to a question that I asked also with regard to wills, which is what happens actually if you, if you lose your mental capacity without having drawn out your LPA? Before we go into that, can I make a very quick point mm. that I think it's very important for us to all know that uh, LPA and a will are, are, are two different kinds of, of documents. Uh, a will only takes effect when I die. Mm. Uh, L L L LPA takes effect when I lose my mind or I've turned into a human, uh, human uh, a vegetable. So if I'm a human vegetable, the, the LPA will take effect. The moment I die, the will takes effect. Yeah, because I think there's a, some, some con, convision that we have where, pe pe uh, where people will wonder when does you know, LPA and, and wills take, take effect. Yeah, so, so that I, I think you should make it clear. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so if I don't have an LPA, and truth to, to be told, I don't have one right now. <laughs> so if I walk out, walk out out of this building and get run over by a car and I turn into a human vegetable, then um, my wife has an unfortunate job of going to a lawyer and getting a court court application mm. under the MCA, the Mental Capacity Act. Right. That's a long process, you know, because uh, you have to file documents, see a lawyer, go through hearings. Typically, that takes about six months from date of filing to get an order. Wow. Yeah, the court will ask lots of questions, and they rightfully should because it's about some, it's, it's about my affairs and my 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 property and my assets. Sure. Yeah. And I guess the question, the follow up question to that would be, if um, in that in that process you pass away, what happens? The your will just kicks in. Correct. At that point, yes. Right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um. I guess my next question would also be, um, in in when the LPA has kicked in, um, how should a family or a loved one uh deal with your personal welfare or property or interest? Like, how would is there any practical advice you can give um in that sort of situation? Uh, the Technically, technically step into my shoes, right? So mm. they make decisions as, as if I'm making. Mm-hmm. So whatever they, they decide and however they want to use my assets and my bank accounts is for my own welfare. So my wife can't go on a, a, a mega kind of a, of, a, of a shopping spree or go and buy herself a very costly car. That's not going to happen, right? I see. So they will still have to manage, uh, you know, uh, my, my my assets, you know, as if I'm I'm the one that that's doing managing. it. Yeah, so they can't do a lot a lot of things. They have to make they have to give an annual re- report to the OPG. I see. Yeah, I see. to so see how to see safeguards. how yeah correct mm. to see what they are doing. So they they can't go on a uh, on a spree. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's my asset. So it's meant for me. Right. Yeah. Because I'm 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 still kind of alive. Mm, yeah. So it's meant for my welfare. Got it. Well, thank you very much for that brief overview. And uh, at the same time, we wanted to share some tips as well for choosing donees, which uh, you may want to consider before appointing the, uh, these folks as your donees. Um, the questions you would ask yourself is, how well does the potential donee manage their own finances? How well do they know your wishes regarding healthcare and finances? Um, do you trust them to actually make decisions in your best interest? And uh, do you believe that these donees can actually handle the responsibility to uh, make decisions on your behalf? Um, do you have any comment on on, on these uh, these tips that we've been given? I think they are good tips. Uh, usually people wonder who they choose to be a donee. Uh, of course, the preference is family members, uh, awesome. relatives, maybe good, very good friends. Um, I, very recently, I had a query where somebody said, uh, I want to make an LPA. I'm single and I can't trust my family or, or I'm not going to burden my friends. Where do I go and find a, a donee? So I think these are very difficult kind of questions that some people may have. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think it's, why it's good to think through very carefully um, and um, choose the, the person that you think will make the best decisions. Yeah, I totally agree on that because obviously you're putting your effectively your affairs in the hands of somebody right. else. Very good. So um, I think with that, I will have a look at our questions to see if there's anything that um, has come up. I I don't see anything that uh, makes sense at the moment. Um, oh, I think I we, in fact we answered a couple of them. Uh, answer a couple of them earlier so I will I think for now we will move on and then try and answer these questions um, in the Q&A session that comes up later I think I just want to make a call out for LPAs sure. I think everybody should do LPAs yeah I mean the, the, the government is doing the pitch so let me join in the pitch I think we <laughs> all should do an LPA because it makes life easier for our loved ones to take care of, of us when we are a human vegetable yeah, yeah. and and uh, from the from the mouth of the horse, so to speak. Uh, so moving on, I think to our next uh, next slide, which is on advanced medical directives and advanced care planning. Um, in this uh, short session, we will try and answer what is an AMD or advanced medical directive. How do we implement an AMD? Um, what is advanced care planning (ACP) and how does the uh, ACP differ from LPAs or AMDs? Uh, as well as choosing your nominated healthcare spokesperson. So uh, to start, let's talk about the Advanced Medical Directive. Um, what is an AMD? Okay, AMD is not very popular, uh, but AMD is technically a document that I sign with a doctor mm-hmm. and to say that if I am on a life support machine, 
uh, please just turn it off. Yeah. yeah. That's what it really means. So I go and see a doctor. Uh, it, it, it could be a general practitioner. And then, and then he will he will go to the form with me, check to make sure that I'm doing this in a voluntary manner. I'm not being forced to do, do this. I know the consequences. And then he I sign it, he witnesses it, he witnesses it, and then it gets sent to the registrar of AMD. And then they will say, Yes, we have got it, and that's when it takes effect. Lawyers are not involved. So it's probably a very simple form, which you know, uh, which I think is good to have. Uh, I had two friends this year who were on a life support machine. Mm -hmm. There was no AMD. The family had a hard time trying to make a decision on to turn off the life support. Wow! And so when you when you mention uh, life support, like when does the AMD kick in? The AMD kicks in when I'm very very ill, mm -hmm. and uh, the doctors are saying there's no chance of survival. And so I'm that, on a life support ma uh, machine. I can't talk. Uh, you know, I, I don't have those ca uh, capabilities to make a, a decision. And you know, I, I'm just breathing because of the life support machine. Understood. And that differs from the um, lasting power of attorney. Correct. Because uh, yeah, because that in the lasting power of attorney, I'm alive. Yeah, I'm I'm alive. I'm a human vegetable, but I'm alive. Whereas in uh, in the AMD, I'm just telling the doctor just turn off the machine. So this is more related to healthcare decisions Correct, rather than yeah, healthcare decisions. Things yeah. about your yeah. welfare yeah. or your um, I think assets. in LPA, I, okay, in the LPA kind of a, of a situation, I may not be on a life support. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm just a human vegetable. Got it. And there's no way the you know the the doc doctors can do anything. So if I'm just a, a vegetable, I, I'm for the last next twenty next twenty years, I'm one. Got it. Whereas in the AMD kind of situation, I mean the in the ICU. I'm on life support and the doctors are saying no, no chance to survive. Got it. So the big difference there. Understood. Understood. And so I think with that, we, we should also highlight that this is a document that uh, doctors prepare and, right. and work with you on. So you should actually consult your doctor when you're preparing yeah. your AMD. Um, and with that, I think we can briefly talk about ACPs because that's a part of our uh, medical decision planning, health decision planning. Um, can we can we can you tell me a little bit about what ACPs are? I, if AMDs are unpopular, I think ACPs are, are even more kind of unpopular. But they, I think they're very they are very interesting uh, thing to do. It's technically to tell a loved one or family mem member what are my wishes, my beliefs, my values in relation to my life, and you know, uh, and you know, and if I fall sick, how do I want to be to be taken care of. Sure. So that means it's like a, the LPA kind of a situation. I'm a human vegetable, uh, but uh, you know, how does my wife know how to take care of me? Yeah. So it's to just let her know, for example, that how I, I know, to let her know my wishes and how I want to, to be treated mm. and, you know, and to live my life. So I, I share my beliefs, my values, my feelings. Yeah. And, and then she tries to bring them into effect. And so you mentioned your wife. Um, what do we need to think about when we're talking about uh, choosing uh, the nominated healthcare spokesperson who is who is the in this situation your wife yeah. um how, what kind of um i think what, what do we have to think about when, yeah. when it comes to these sort generally of what uh, in singapore what's spoken of is that you know that the the person who's spokesperson has to be 21 years old has to be you know of course uh, uh, an adult and be able to make such decisions and to be able to have an appreciation of what I'm saying and to have a, have a relationship with me and then who's able to convey those wishes when I'm not able to do so. So it, it's the, it's, they must be fit, I guess, yeah, in all sense of the word. I, I totally understand. And, and I think on that note, we will um, move on to the next slide where we can actually show briefly a, a bit of a comparison uh, between the three types of um, uh, the, uh, Devices, I would call yeah. it, um, that there's oh, available. instruments, yeah. instruments, yeah. yeah. Um, because these are, are three. While they are similar in that they deal with uh, similar topics, I think we 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 also say that they cover very different um, uh, situations within one's life. Mm -hmm. um, and and was there anything maybe that you wanted to yeah. speak to? But on I this? think it's very interesting, right? If you look at this slide, ACP and and LP are so close to each other. Yeah, if you look at the when is when is, when is it used, they they're very close to each other. They really take effect when I've lost my mind. Got yeah, it. Got but it. the the difference is when I've lost my mind and I don't have an ACP, then you know how I want to be taken care of, no one knows. 
Yeah. So my wife has to just make a, a, her own decisions. Which which can, I guess, um, create a lot more stress at a time when, you know, it, yeah. it is obviously already very stressful and then Correct. your wife has to deal with all these additional um, questions. Yeah. So it actually makes things potentially easier for them mm-hmm. if uh, your, your partner, um, when you are faced with that situation. So um, we're going to leave this slide up for a little while and, and talk a little bit more about um, perhaps thinking about what kind of, um, uh, what would you want to put into these documents? Like how, uh, is there anything you can think about when considering these issues with life? You're talking about ACP or generally speaking? Uh, ACP or AMD actually, yeah. generally for both. I think AMD is very really straightforward, right? It's yeah. just a very simple uh, kind of document that says, please don't be resuscitate me if I'm on a life support. My machine just turned it off. So they're very simple. ACP is more general. I think it's really, and in ACP, the good thing about it is that my wishes may change through my life. Sure. So it's a continuous kind of discussion. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's, and, and, and ACP is not done by lawyers. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's a life uh, kind of a document, a life document that can change. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. I think it's good to have, uh, you know, uh, but at the same time, I think one can also continuously tell their loved ones what how they want to be treated during their life. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So I think the the only thing that we wanted to add to this um, was to remember when you're choosing your nominated healthcare spokesperson, your NHS, um, that th- this person first has to be willing to act in that capacity. Um, they have to understand what you prefer, what you believe and value. And also um, be able to set aside their own preferences uh, to follow your wishes or preferences as well. I think uh, that's where the difficulty comes, especially when it comes to, you know, you mentioned your wife yeah. uh, or, or, or or potential husband. Um, there, there is always that, that, that concern that um, in that situation, they may or may not be able to continue to follow your, yeah. your wishes. So that's something to think about as part of your choosing your NHS. Um, well, very good. I, I think we can now uh, we can now start uh, taking questions from the audience. Um, there are quite a few of them, so let's go through them uh, one by one. I, I, yeah, there's really quite a few. So I'm gonna deal with a few of them in in a batch. But let's start with Will, since that was the first thing that we we spoke about. Um, We've answered a couple of these already, but uh, I, I, re- I do recognize also that some participants have just joined. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, we can just have a conversation, but uh, yeah, sure. if, if, if it comes up, it comes up again. So I hope you don't mind. We sure. have to repeat a couple of times. Um, this one I quite like. Can I write my own will or just use a template that I found on the internet? <laughs> we, were, we were having a discussion this morning on the same topic, uh, coincidentally. Yeah, surely. I mean, I have friends um, who have made homemade wheels, as, as, we, as we call it. They write it out and then they make sure that it's properly uh, witnessed. Um, so you can have a DIY wheels. There's also uh, nowadays, you know, a lot of entities in Singapore where, who help you to do wheels. Um, and, and I think you can, you can do it with them as well. Yeah. The, the only thing is that when you do a, a wheel with a, a non-lawyer, Mm-hmm. Then the legal advice and the implications, the effects of certain things, you know, that may not be very well, well, well put to you. Yeah. So you can, so in short, you can do your DIY wheels. You, you can go to third party providers or non lawyers. I mean, like all things in life, you take it, you do it at your own risk. Yeah. That's very helpful to know. Um, and related to that question, I guess, is um, what, how do we actually start the process of? drawing up a will. Um, this this question, questioner asks, is it the, is the first step to itemize all the assets that we find in our, uh, that we have like your bank accounts, your jewelry, all that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's, it's just a very good question, if I may say so, because uh, generally you don't have to, but I think it's good practice to have a list of uh, a schedule, a schedule of your assets, so that you know family members will know when when I'm no longer around. So, but the the thing about doing a schedule of assets is that you have to keep on uh, giving an update, yeah. change, you know, and all that, and you must do that lifelong. Yeah. 
So the key thing to note is that you do not have to have a schedule of assets. You can just make a will without it. You just have to think about what do you want? Are you going to say, I'm going to make a very simple will. I'm just going to say whatever I have at the point of death, it goes to all these people in whatever shares or proportions. Yeah, I, I can do that. And that's the most simple will. That's most of us, they, uh, we do that. If there are children who are minor, then you think about guardians for the children. You think about how you're going to, um, uh, you know, whatever gifts I'm going to give to, to my children, you know, do I, hold it on, do I get the guardians to hold it on trust for them? Till they are, they are, uh, they are kind of of age. I mean, I mean, of course, in terms of of age in Singapore is twenty one, but you may not want to give hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars to a child who's twenty one years old. You will, <laughs> you will just go and buy a car. Sure. Yeah. So you may you may say you know in some wills I've done where we'll say the child gets it at twenty five or even thirty. Yeah. So do, during that time, you know, there's a duty for the the guardians or the trustees to only on trust. Mm. Uh, you know, and uh, and also to use whatever, you know, that I've given to this child for his maintenance, his welfare. And on, on that point, um, I think I saw a question where, um, is it possible to set up such trust via the will or does it have to be set up beforehand? Trust is not very really common in Singapore uh, because people think that it's really for the wealthy. Um, so people tend to do wills only, they don't do trust. But I think the, there is a discussion going on right now about doing trust, uh, especially when you have minor children. Yeah, mm. so that that's some that's some something that you have to think about. Uh, they are independent. A, a will is a will, a trust, a trust. I mean, sure. to, to say it in a very simple way. That's that's helpful to know. Yeah. And I think uh, you already mentioned that there is really no need to have a schedule of assets. Mm. Um. So when it comes to say, for example, my my car, um, if I was to put it in my will to get passed down to my children or whatever. Um, if they, for example, my children are two and five, so they can't drive, what happens in that situation? Like, if I if I was to will it to my children, for example. Uh, but if you will it to your children, then uh, it all depends, right? At the point, okay, I think I, I, will, I will use myself as an example because it's easier. Yeah. So if I will, if I have a car and, and I will it to, uh, to my children, then it all depends on what age they get the car, right? Sure. I mean, you probably only go to one child, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So if at the point of my death and the child is not even tw uh, 18, mm -hmm. then technically, then I think the trustees will have to hold it on trust for them till the child is 18 or, tw or 21 years old. Understood. Yeah. Understood. I think at 18, you get a driver's license, but I don't, I don't know why they want the child to drive a car at 18. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. it. <laughs> people don't usually set uh, uh, leave cars behind so far, mm. but people do want to uh, leave behind the HGB flats. Yeah. And that is a bit tricky because if I'm going to leave my HDB flat to my children, for example, mm -hmm. and they are not married and they are maybe 20, you know, 20, 21, yeah. Um, then the problem is if I if they take the flat, sure. then if they in the future want to buy their own flat, buy their own flat then yeah. there's an issue. So I, I, I personally never thought it was a very good thing to uh, wheel away flats to children. Or for example, I, I will away flat to a to a child and when I die, he already has a flat. But then and, and then we all stuck. know, right? He yeah. he can't own two flats. Yeah. So he has to sell off the flats. The, the, the sell off One my the flat. my flat. Yeah. Or or his flat. Yeah. And then, you know, and then he'll get the sale proceeds. Yeah. But so it, generally I think it's good practice to just say sell the flat and then the sale proceeds will go to my children. Sure. But I guess on that note, uh, is there a possibility for us, for example, if at that situation, the asset is not worth as much as say if we waited six months or a year, is it possible for the executor to uh, make that decision? Can they do so? I think to sell an asset. To, to hold it and then sell it at a later time or, or you know, do, do it so, not dispose of it immediately. Yeah. I mean, he can do that, mm -hmm. but uh, he must get the consent of the beneficiaries. Ah, yeah, if the beneficiaries want him to sell it now, then and he has no share choice. the sale process, he has yeah. no choice. Got it. Okay, um, we have had a couple of questions about the location of the will. So I'm just going to combine them into one. Um, is there a place that I can register my will? And uh, we had a similar question, but I'm going to repeat it. Um, where should I keep my will? Or, and how should, should I let my loved ones know where I've kept it? Or should, can I just let a lawyer keep it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, firstly, lawyers can't keep wills because we have too many <laughs> yeah so uh nowadays what 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 we all do is that we just scan a copy and, and give them the, the originals sure um the wills registry in singapore 
uh, you can inform them a will was made. Mm. But a will is a private uh, piece of paper or document until I die. So I can't lodge the will in the rules registry, but I can inform them on a certain day and time. I mean, on a certain day, um, the will was made at this law firm. I see. So it's only a record of the fact that the will yes, was, was made on, on the day it was made and who were the, law, the lawyers. I have one interesting one. Should um, we go back to safekeeping? Oh, please. Yeah, because that comes up all the time. People <laughs> always ask, how do I safekeep a will? Um, generally, I think no one is providing uh, ser uh, services of safekeeping. Uh, people who do are, 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 you know, are private uh, groups and entities. Sure. Uh, but most people don't use them. So uh, the best thing to do is to keep all your documents in a safe folder or place. You know, some people may even put them in, in the locker. Like a safety deposit box. Yeah, correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then inform the, love, uh, fa the loved one, at least the spouse. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because I, I think the difficult thing is also you never know what happens. So you, you want to know where all of this is kept. Um, I, I, I certainly keep mine scanned uh, and, and placed in the cloud so that uh, at least there's that copy. Um, what if I only found the will three years after the death of a loved one? I mean, although in the, our courts, it does say that you have to get the probate. The, the probate is a grant of probate what you file in court once I passed away. Mm -hmm. So that you get a court order for my wife to deal with the assets. Sure. Yeah. So it, it, it does say you have to do it in six months. If you don't, you have to give very good reasons why you mm -hmm. didn't do it. But a lot of people don't do don't do the pro, don't go and do the probate work till much later. Sure. Um, and so far there's no problems. You know, you just tell the court why it took so long and the courts never ask questions. Okay. Yeah. So, so three years even is if okay, I didn't I know even if I didn't right. know. Yeah. So three years is okay, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I apologize for the dead air. I'm just reading through the many questions that have come through. Um, what happens if, uh, and I guess they use the word donees here, but possibly means also beneficiaries. Um, what happens if all my donees that I nominated passes on before me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if that happens, in the will, what we usually do, we have a substitute uh, a person or beneficiary. Mm. Like, for example, if I do a will and I give it to my children, mm. um, I could also say if my child is not, if my children are not alive, it will go to their children in, in equal shares. Mm -hmm. So you have a substitute uh, uh, kind of a person who will get it, a uh, beneficiary. Yeah. So um, that's what how we do to, to make sure that, you know, that somebody else will get it. Yeah, usually we have only one line of substitute. So if if in the event there's uh, even the children are not uh, alive kind of alive when I'm around, then it goes to the the rest of the, re, the remaining the remaining of my estate, which mm -hmm. then will go to to some other uh, people or persons. And would that follow the intestate laws or or no? Yes, it will. So it will go under the there is there will be a, a clause to say whatever is the residue, the balance, mm -hmm. it will go to somebody. So that will fall into the balance. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then maybe since they use the term donies, like uh, in the situation of an LPA, um, I think that's where it comes from, right? Donies. Um, what happens if the donies in the LPA pass on? Mm -hmm. um, that's why in the LPA form, you will see the substitute uh, donies. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you can have two donors, uh, sorry, two donies and two substitute uh, do donies. Or, so there are about four people. Oh, yeah. I see. So there are alternatives. Yes. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> this is phrased quite uniquely, so I feel like I must ask it. Um, no relatives and don't want to ask friends how to do LPA. Which is exactly what I said a while ago, right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's unfortunate, you know, but uh, lately I was posed this question, so it's real, I think. Uh, I don't think you know, uh, I, I, there's a solution here. You really have to find somebody. If not, then what happens is that you don't do LPA. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I think that's the answer we have for you. Um, so this is an interesting question I, and it probably goes into the, the weeds a little bit about the LPA. But um, I heard that there is a part A and a part B for the LPA. Ah. What is the difference? So it's the form, form A and form B. Yeah. yeah, Form A is the prescribed one. You can download from the internet. If you go to the OPG's web website, 
it's there. That's form one. Go form on. one is easy. It's all done up for, for us. We just have to fill it up. The government intentionally did that so that more and more people will, will sign up, uh, sign the LPA. Um, and it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty, it's still a very long form, but it's easy. Form two involves drafting. So if you have very complex kind of wishes uh, and you want it to be drafted, then you go to a lawyer and the lawyer will draft out form two or form B. Uh, but most of us use form one Got it. or form E. Yeah. Um, going back to wills for a minute. Um, and this is a good question, actually. How do I know? I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, mm-hmm. but how do I know which banks does my, uh, does whoever in the will have? Like, um, I, I think what they were trying to ask was, um, you know, do I have, how do I know where to go and collect back all these assets? That's if why they don't think, list it in the in the said schedule, I know what you mean. Yeah. That's why I think a schedule of assets is very useful, right? Yeah. Although the cumbersome things that you must keep on changing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why I also said about keeping all your, your documents in a safe place. Mm. So if you have uh, all your bank statements and all that, you keep them in a safe place. Usually most of my clients who come to me to do a grant appropriate, they have an idea. They would have gathered all the like the the door the the door documents that the loved ones have received and then those are the ones that we write to. I think it's practically not very practical to write to all the banks in Singapore. Uh, it's, it's not practical. <laughs> sure. So that's why uh, um, I, people usually will gather what they see at home and then they bring to us. Yeah. What happens if you miss out though? Else? Then I think it's just going to, I mean, if it's miss out, hopefully the bank will write to the family. At some point. Yeah. yeah. And then, and, and, and that's how you will, you will know about it. So you may get a, a letter, for example, if, in, in my case, it will be for the state of me. Right. Yeah, and then and that's how uh, how my wife might know that I've got some some other some other assets. Got it. Got it. Um, are if a person died uh, who was intestate, um, are stepchildren entitled to the assets? Uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I won't profess to know the list of the people who will get it. How it works, yeah. Uh, because the list is very kind of, um, it's a long list and it goes down all the mm. way. Um, I think if they, uh, okay, if they rank at all and 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 this please do check with a lawyer. Someone else that, because I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Raj- yeah. Rajan is an expert, but he does, hasn't memorized. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, we, you know, lawyers don't know all the things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, our advice, yeah. I think, so I think they come down the line. Lawyer. I think yeah. they come down the line. Yeah, I know. Uh, or, go and go and check up. Now, this internet is so easy. Go and go to the Intestate Succession Act. Go and Google it up. And it's a very short act. So, you will see it. There's the, the list of priorities. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have a I have a good one. Can um, can the will be done digitally? Since this is a digital world, <laughs> up to today, no, no. It it, it has to be a hard copy. And has to be done. Yeah, uh, and yes, because you're you're designed. How are you going to sign? Exactly. How are you going to sign in front of? I mean, how am I going to sign in front of my two witnesses? How are they going to sign in in front of me? Uh, I think wills are one of the last things that will ever go into uh, the form of, of digital, a digital kind yeah. of document. Yeah. I think they will, they'll be the last one to go. So even during the pandemic, we couldn't sign wills uh, via Zoom. Really? Yeah, you know, court documents and all that could be signed via Zoom, but wills couldn't be done. Yeah. I mean, that was, oh, wow, I, I didn't know that. Because that's, that, that they, they didn't come up with laws to, you know, for, the... for, for wills. They came up with, with court documents. Right, yeah. right, right. Um. Is there any tax to pay um, if the estate is of a certain amount? Okay. Uh, what about the lawyer's fees? Is it higher if the estate is higher? <laughs> I'm not sure we can answer that piece, but um, and then can we put all the money to CPF to avoid fees? <laughs> okay, the good news is that yeah, the good news is that there's you know there's no need to pay duties on on you know the in terms of estate duty that was got rid of many years ago. So that's good news. Uh, in terms of lawyers' fees, that's always asked me every talk I do. Yeah, um, it all depends on the on the lawyers that you go to. Um, I don't not think doing a will or, or going doing a grant appropriate is very expensive because they are not very they are not so difficult. A mental capacity act uh, kind of application is it's very expensive. That it is, but wills and probate they are not. Yeah, so it, I I think they're still not too pricey. Oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, what happens if you cannot locate the beneficiary? Locate. Mm. Okay. 
Um, I mean, you have to, you know, um, find him or her. <laughs> Uh, I think there are there are rules to to say how long you have to uh, keep their share. Mm. Uh, you have duties to put out in terms of advertisements, sure, or on the internet and things like that. If you know that somebody is living in Johor, for example, you must have taken steps to go and find that person. Sure. Yeah. If you can't find it, then I think uh, there is a number of years. And again, I'm not very sure. You know, Jerry, I must say this: some of these questions are very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that, that's the purpose of today's yeah. session. Um, yeah. but but at the same time, I think we also need to highlight that, that some of these questions need to be answered by your lawyer when 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 you not are only that, but, up the but these are not common uh, questions. I think they're good questions. Yeah, they're not common questions. But I know you have to go and find your your beneficiary and and take steps to to go and find them. Okay. I'm going to... Ah, okay, this was uh, related to an earlier question. Is it compulsory to register the will with the will registry? Oh, no, it's not. It's really... Uh, they charge $50. That's a fixed fee they charge. You don't have to. But I think it's a good practice too. So yep. that, you know, in case people can't find the will at home, uh, you know, then, you know, uh, they can go and check with the... Do a search in the will's registry. Um... I'm gonna go do a quick quick fire one because there's quite there's a few that probably can be answered quite quickly. Um, if a deceased has outstanding debts, debts, what should the beneficiary do? I mean the the value of the estate. I think first you have to pay off the debts. Mm. I think that is clearly a must. If not the if not the estate will be sued. Exactly. Yeah, so it's good practice to pay off the debts. If the debts are more than the value of the estate, then you know then I you know then it's an insolvent estate. Um, you know, uh, there's not very much that uh, the rest of the f uh, family is is going to get. Understood. Understood. Yeah, so there's a duty of the trustees and, exec and executors to pay out the debts. Ah, here's an interesting one. Um, what happens if a testator does not read or write English? You could have, I mean, the law doesn't say the will must be in English. Hmm. The law says the will can be in any language. Mm -hmm. Even signature, the law says you can do a thumbprint. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, the fact you, you don't speak English, that's not a problem. Can, um, can the, so you just need to find someone who is willing to draft it in the language of your children? Usually when uh, they come to lawyers, we will draft in English, then we will interpret it and there'll be a clause to say that it was interpreted by the lawyer and signed by the, the, by, by the person who makes the will or what we call the testator. Got it, got it. Um, can the executor of the will be also a beneficiary? Yes, he can be. Um, so I kind of done with my quick fire. Oh wait, uh, there's one more. Um, what happens if uh, the testator is one of two partners in a shop? How will the assets be divided? Um, if it's a partnership, and okay, uh, let's say I, I have a business and I'm a partner. If I die, then we have to look at what the partnership uh, partnership contract or an agreement that I sign says. Um, you know, so uh, and then we have to see how what I mean if, if there's a proper kind of partner, partnership contract or an agreement, then that should take care of what will happen if I'm no longer around. Um, it should also state what is my assets that will fall into my estate. Yeah, so that I think some there's something that we have to I think a bit more deeply. Yeah, and it all depends on the contract. I Correct. Think. Yeah. yeah. Um. What if I decide to make a will to give my assets to siblings or parents and not to my children or spouse? Is that possible? Um, I think the good practice is to say I've considered uh, about giving something to my wife and my children. I've decided not to and put down the reasons. Uh, you can actually do that in your will. You can do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I had clients who have done that. Uh, who have said I'm not giving this son because I've given him more than enough. For example, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, that doesn't mean my wife and children won't go and fight with my parents and my siblings. <laughs> and then we will have a case in the court. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> what happens... Okay, this is an interesting one. Um, what happens if the law firm or the lawyer who had the will passes away? Does it affect the validity of the will? No, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't at all because the will is, is my personal uh, piece of document. So if my lawyers have passed on, it does not uh, matter at all. I think the problem might be to find, uh, if you want a, a copy of the will, finding it, finding it from the lawyers will be difficult. That's all. 
but validity of the will and doing the probate all, there's no issue. So we have a very practical question. This one has had the most votes today, four votes. Um, what happens after the person passes and there is a will? Um, do you just take it to and bring it to a law firm? Uh, what is the next step, I guess, is, this person is asking? So this is what I talked about a while ago, the grant of probate. Yeah. yeah, so it's a court proceedings. So usually what people do, they will bring the will and the documents uh, showing my assets to a lawyer. And then he will uh, help them to prepare a whole set of documents, file them in the state courts usually, get a court orders, uh, you know, what, what we call a grant of probate with a nice seal, with a schedule of assets. And then um, and that whole process takes about four months. It's relatively quite simple, so but it will take about four months. And then once I once my wife has a grant of probate with a with a court seal, uh, then she can bring it to the banks and and close the bank accounts and take the funds in it. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, I'm going to for now just move on briefly away from wills. I know we still have quite a lot of questions regarding wills, um, but we also want to cover, I think, other um, the other topics that we spoke on today. Um, is a DNR a part of the uh, an AMD? A uh, DNR is part of? And I think DNR here stands for do not resuscitate. Yeah. yeah. That's part of them. AMD, yes, correct. That's what pe people sign the AMD. Yeah, is to say that do not, you know, uh, you know, sort of, of resuscitate me or don't keep the life support going on. Okay. Um, in your view, whether should we appoint the same healthcare spokesperson um, uh, for your ACP as the donee in your in the LPA? I don't see why you can't, and there's no law on that. Mm. Um, I. Personally, I think it makes sense to me. Yeah. In my donor in the LPA, you know, and then I can talk to him and tell him about you know, what I want and what are my wishes if I'm a human vegetable. Yeah. So I think it's good to have a spokesperson in the ACP and the donor is in person. I have only one child. Is an LPA still relevant? This is an interesting question. I, I don't know why the child uh, mm. is relevant. I mean, here. if the L if the donor is going to be the child. Um, I, I I don't see the the relevance for that. Uh, maybe it was about will. Uh, if it's okay, why don't we just talk about both? Yeah, yeah if it's a will, I I still think that I will make a will even if, if even if I have, I have only child. If I don't even have children, I'll still make a will uh, for the wife, the loved ones, siblings, nieces, nephews, and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, LPA, I think it does not ma matter uh, if you only have one child. Whether you are single or married, yeah, and, and LPA works for all. And I think maybe it's worth talking briefly about uh, if you go into an intestacy situation. That I, I think it's very different in terms yeah, of procedure, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So in that case, then fifty percent goes to the my wife, and then forty percent will go to the the one child. Yeah. Um. Okay, there's quite a few questions about timing, I guess. Um, and I think to kind of blanket answer all these questions about timing is once you've lost capacity, I think it's very difficult to say that you can draft any of these documents. Yeah. So the, the, I think the whole point of today's session is to really advise um, our listeners and our viewers that um, you really need to get it done before anything happens. Um, because once you lose capacity or, or the ability to right. make your will or, or ACP or yeah. LPA. So the time is now. Yeah. Uh, let's all do it now. Yeah. I think both of us actually were having a discussion beforehand, before this session where we said, oh, really, we should be looking at all of this now that we've talked, uh, we've yeah. done our research and looked into the all this. Yeah. So um, I think I think in terms of timing, once you've crossed the threshold, then there's nothing you can do to I mean, roll uh, it back. Maybe I can give an example. Yeah. Um, I had a friend whose uh, brother um, was, was dying of cancer and was losing his faculties. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to do an LPA. Um, and uh, the timing was so important because it's, most of us do it when there's a crisis, right? Uh, 
yeah so timing then becomes very, very important so he was talking to me and then you know and then what was he discussing with family members and all that and then by the time she came back to me uh, the doctors told her no he can't sign lpa he, he has lost his mental affair faculty mm -hmm. he's too ill uh, he can't talk you know yeah there's no way so that, that that's quite important in terms of lpa same thing for wheels yeah so if, if i if i lost my you know if i'm if the doctor says i'm not fit to me to make a wheel then you know uh, though i'm still alive i can't make a wheel mm -hmm. that's why we always the elderly people who come and see us we always make sure that they really know what they're doing they have the mental ca capacity and then you know and they really want to do a wheel so we all we see even though if they're brought by family members we see them privately have a long chat with them uh, and to, to make sure that this is voluntary this is what they want to do and their wishes uh, you know uh, is what they want and not forced by the children that's very good um very good comment there as well um we're gonna re-answer this question because unfortunately i think uh it's come up a few times already but I'll, we'll answer it once once more um do we have to create a separate nomination for insurance policies and then as a sub question what about cpf okay so i'll, I'll run through that very quickly if your policy says estate and not a person then yes you have to state so in your will yeah so that's quite clear uh cpf you know like i said a while ago uh you can't will it away you have to go and sign the, the nomination form at the cpf board yeah actually it's i think they now have an app for it yes you know it's yeah. now it's, it's all so easy yeah. it's actually quite easy for, yeah. to, to, to do your cpf nomination so even the lpa is going to be via and and online soon oh, wow and, uh, you know and it's all going to be done quite easier than now so you, you, you don't even have papers fantastic yeah that makes it a lot easier yeah um <laughs> being Singaporean, I think we will, we want to know the answer to this question. Um, if we are transferring private property from deceased to a beneficiary, would it be subject to stamp duty? Okay, I, I don't do real, real estate work, so I'm thinking <laughs> very hard. Uh, please do go and check it out. Okay, but for today's purposes, um, you know, I I'm guessing that you don't have to because it's. Uh, due to uh, it's a transfer uh, due to an estate i think you don't have to just like even in a divorce when there's a court order when you do a transfer you don't have to pay stamp duty so i believe you don't have to but please check it out yeah yeah once again we remind everyone on this call this is not um meant to be legal advice if you have any of these specific questions do check with your own lawyer when you are uh, dealing with them um okay does the ACP need to be officiated? Does is there, the, is there anything specific that needs to be happened? I think we've answered this question as part of our overall discussion. Um, uh, I think we did not. Oh, but an ACP. I mean, we're going to look up on the in the internet, and that's where we all did our preparation for this evening. <laughs> uh, it says that there are service providers who um, who can help you to do that, mm -hmm. but it is not really very clear to me from the the read the for the research I did. It's not very clear to me, like a will or LPA, how it's going to be done. Um, and it's also evolving wishes and what I want. So I, I'm not very sure how that's going to be carried out. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know how these deep discussions are going to put on record. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, do go and check it out and, uh, and talk to the service providers who do the ACP. This is interesting. And it goes to the capacity question um, and quite real life example. Um, if we bring... If I'm, I'm going to try and anonymize it a little bit, but if we bring a parent to a lawyer to make a will, but that parent has dementia, is it possible to still carry out a, a will? Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, firstly, please don't bring a parent see if you know they have dementia, because once they have dementia, you cannot make a will, a LPA, they will or, or an AMD yeah. for that ma the matter, but that's just all about wills. So yeah. Yeah. No, surely not. Uh, we always take great pains to make sure and to check yeah. uh, whether the person who comes before us really is very, very clear. The older the person, the more we check. Yeah. And, uh, and, and okay, we're not doctors, uh, but if you have suspicion, we will ask them to go and get a doctor to give a, a, so a, a letter. And yeah. I've done that for many of my clients. Yeah. I said, you get a doctor to give a letter. Before. Uh, and sometimes, you know, and a lot of times the, do the doctors don't give the letter. Yeah. 
At which point it would then be too late actually yeah, to, to right, go ahead yeah. and, and so um, yeah. sign a will or yeah. which again goes back to our advice earlier, which is the time is now <laughs> if you're yes, thinking about yeah. signing these documents. Um, how many wills are usual for a person to make in one lifetime? I think there's no number to it. <laughs> As I said a while ago, my friend made seven and now she's doing seven wheel, and I think this is not a final wheel. She's 75, uh, no, 76, but I don't think so it's a final wheel. So you can do as many as you want. But the key thing is the last wheel that is present when I die, that's the one that takes effect. Yeah. The last, before the last wheel, if I've done 10, those 10 are not effective. Got it. Got it. Um, I have an interesting question, which I'm not sure you're able to answer, um, but I'll ask it anyway. Do Muslims need to make a will? Sharia wills, yes. They do make Sharia wills. Uh, I don't know Sharia wills because that's a whole uh, kind of regime by itself. Yeah. But they can make wills um, and there are a lot of rules and regulations. So do go and talk to a Sharia law, uh, lawyer about will making. It's, it's very different from wills that we have talked about this evening. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Okay, uh, actually, tagging on to our previous question about uh, not being able to make a will once you lost your capacity, um, what happens if if we are no longer, uh, ha we no longer have the capacity? Uh, can we only rely on intestacy laws? Yes, if I've lost my mind or I'm a human vegetable, I got no will, uh, then you have no choice. That's the only way is to go on what the law says. Mm. Um, yeah, which which does ha happen a quite a fair bit. Uh, I had a, a former schoolmate's um, a husband who's very young, who passed on, and he didn't make a will. Yeah, so that 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 happens because you you just don't know, right? When yeah. these things do do happen, yeah. So then the uh, grant of letters of of administration, the grant of letters of administration will take effect. That's for people who are, who don't have wills. So you just have to go to file an application for grant of letters of, of administration. Would there be a checklist that you, you have in your mind um, of what you need to prepare before uh, doing a will? Um, okay. Usually, I mean, lawyers, and, and I also do that, we do um, uh, have um, a, like, like a questionnaire for people to think about and to fill up. And that will form the basis of the contents, contents of the will. Yeah. Um, I, I, I generally, I think people find it very, very difficult to do wills. And that's one reason why they don't do, I think. This is the fact that it's very sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. So they always don't know what, who to give it to. Yeah. So we usually have a questionnaire that will get them starting king. Mm. Yeah. In relation to what they want to do and, and who they want to give to. Makes sense. Uh, most of the our most of us our wills are very simple. Yeah, uh, it's just that when you know when you're a bit wealthier mm -hmm. or you know uh, of some means, then your wills become very very uh, complex in nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Must we apply for a grant of probate in order to execute the will? Say again, sorry. Excuse me. <clears throat> Must we uh, apply for grant of pro probate in order to execute the will? Oh, I think it's vice versa. You do a will. You sign a will, the will is valid, uh, then I pass on, then you do, then you you go to court and get a grant of probate. So it's wills first, I pass on, then the probate. And do we need to get the grant of probate after we pass on? Uh yes. Uh if you have any assets that needs to that okay, if the, the, if the, the if if I do have assets in my own sole name and the bank says no, we're not going to release it to you, uh to my wife. You mm -hmm. go and get a grant of, of probate. Yes, you have to. Got it. I mean, usually we all do have some some assets, right? Very few people have no assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, although um, the some sometimes when we have you know elderly people, sometimes they may only just have a joint account with a child, and a, and a flat in their sole name, yeah, or even the, the a flat with the, in the uh, jointly held with a with a child. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, even if a will, but there are no assets. Uh, yeah, right. so you know, because the joint the joint account will you know will then uh, go to the child that who is the joint account holder, and the flag will then go to the child. So there's no need to do a grant of probate, but I think most of us will do. Um, I think we have a we have a few questions. 
Um, ah, okay. This is an interesting one. If I have assets outside of uh, Singapore, um, what is the best practice when it comes to will making? Today is a very weird day because a lot of things that had that took place in daytime now they are turning into questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a, uh, uh, somebody who wrote to me an email who lives in somewhere nearby and he said, I'm a foreigner, I don't live in Singapore, but I have bank accounts. What do I do? Mm. You know, you know, I, I want to do a will. Yeah. So if I were to have bank accounts in India, for example, yeah. You know, and I want, um, you know, and I want those to be taken care of when I'm no longer around. So, uh, I think what I will do is I'll make a will in India, and then once I die, uh, you know, there will be a grant of probate done in India for that bank account, so that that bank account can be closed and dealt with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that's how how it works. Some people will go around doing wills in in every country where they have assets. Uh, because of the, you know, it, when when they're no longer no longer around, they have to go and get a grant appropriate in that country. So that's easier that way. So they do that. Some people don't. They say, okay, I'm in Singapore. I've got, you know, I've got access all over the world. I'll just make a, uh, I only will make a will in Singapore. It's easier that way. And then you can make a will of whatever. I mean, I can make a will rather of whatever I have all around the world in Singapore. And I find in Singapore, the uh, grant of probate is obtained in Singapore for Singapore assets. So if I have got have got assets in India, then my uh, wife takes this grant of probate, goes to India, and what we call reseal or convert into an Indian probate, and to to deal with that bank uh, the bank account. Difficult, but that's the way it is. Understood. Yeah. Understood. So I'm gonna have like last three questions or so. I, I think we're gonna try and end a little bit early today because. Um, I think we've kind of covered the same few questions already. So if you have any questions now, um, do put them in and then we will try and answer them before we go through. Um, this one, I'm going to have to reword it a bit uh, just because I think it's a little bit controversial. Um, but generally speaking, is it possible for someone to accuse a third party of having undue influence over the will-making process? That happens sometimes, uh, and thankfully sometimes, and that is always a case where siblings or children uh, make that kind of an accusation. Mm. Um, and they, and these are the kind of cases that we read about in the media. Sure. Yeah. So it does happen uh, when a ch a child is not is unhappy for not getting anything or even getting something very small in value. Sure. Then he 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 accuses, and then that excuse me, and that turns into a. a Controversy. Uh, yeah. Court suit. Is it yeah. a, a high court suit? Yeah. So that happens. It can be done. People do it. Not often, thankfully. Yeah. Um, what happens if a bank account has uh, two joint owners and it requires both account holders to sign and then what, and one member of the two passes away or loses mental capacity? I think it's best to check with the bank yeah. how is that going to work. It's a joint account holder. Uh, so usually joint account holders, we all know as lawyers, that if I pass on, then my wife gets all the funds at joint account. Signatures, I think that's really for transactions, checks and stuff like that. I think, I don't think so. It's for probate or if, I, if I'm no longer, no, no longer around, she should get the whole funds in the bank account. But again, you know, do check with the banks. Fantastic. And uh, uh, I'm going to choose one last question. Um, if you had to rank or give an opinion about the priority um, of the documents um, between a will and LPA, AMD and ACP, um, what would you, how would you rank it in terms of uh, what you would prioritize? Oh, what's the must-do, is it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a hard question. And there have been many hard questions this evening. Uh, but uh, I think um, a will, okay, I will rank personally mm. a will and an LPA. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't give, if I don't do an AMD, I'm fine with it, I guess. Yeah. But I think it's, yeah. it's a very personal decision. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you want to know my ranking, I think uh, people should do wills and LPA. That's more important. I don't think so. I think uh, uh, AMD will come third and the ACP because it's not really very clear how it's going to work. That comes last. Mm. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, I think we will wrap it up here this evening. Uh, we do have some uh, additional questions, but I think some quite a few of them have already been answered. Mm. And my understanding is that uh, that uh, this video is available online. So uh, do do rewatch and and uh, feel free to 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 uh, look at the video and and see uh, the responses that Rajan has has given. Um, we are going to bring our Q and A session today to a close. Um, at the end of uh, this webinar, a survey form will pop up on your screen for your completion. Um, we do really appreciate your comments as uh, it will be used to improve future webinars. And there are indeed very, very many more webinars as part of Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2022. Um, please scan the QR code or visit our website, uh, bit.ly uh, slash Law CDC 2022 to find out more about the other webinars. If you are facing any legal inquiries or uh, are keen to register for a legal clinic session, you may write to enquiry at lawsocprobono.org. I'll repeat that. It's enquiry at lawsocprobono.org as shown on the slide. Uh, we would very much like to uh, express our gratitude to Rajan for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us today. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and uh, with that, I would very much like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, oh, wait, I do have one additional thing to tag on to um, our discussion today. Uh, we also do actually have another webinar called Legal Considerations for Caregivers, where we will address legal matters when your loved ones slowly loses their physical or mental capacity uh, and gives you answers on what you can do. Uh, this webinar will be on Tuesday, 25th of November, 2022. And you can register for that webinar by the link uh, in the chat or uh, go to the Law at CDC website. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening, and we do wish you a very lovely week ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.